Rudy, it's the start of February. We're about to kick off into reporting season. Yes. Uh, we were having a chat last week. It's a bit ridiculous that the torrent of information that gets uh, thrust into investors' inboxes and, and over the screens. And for a lot of people, it is uh, too much information to digest in mm. such a short period of time. We get fatigue. Uh, so as someone that's been analysing reporting seasons for 17 years, um, I thought we'd get you in to have a chat about some of the things that you've learned over nearly two decades of yes. checking out reporting seasons. And what I really want to do is see if we can find some actionable strategies and techniques that Livewire readers can put into practice for reporting yeah. season. So Happy to share some of my insights and observations. Well, why don't we start, first question. Have you figured out if investors can actually create value in reporting season? Definitely. I think reporting seasons are one of the underestimated periods in the year. I mean, in between reporting seasons, it's, it's, I mean, anything can happen and any reason can be good enough to, to jump on or off a stock. I mean, momentum, technical charting, uh, sentiment, uh, company announcements. Uh, I mean, you look at the chart, oh, it's going up or it's, or it's going down. I mean, you lose patience, all of that. But then come reporting season comes along and that's basically like your, your, that's your check. That's your actual check on whether everything that we were all, as a community, we were all thinking and predicting and, and speculating in advance, whether that actually is accurate. And I'm actually surprised. One of the reasons why we spend so much time on the reporting season is A, because very few others are doing it, and B, if they are doing it, the, the details of, of their analysis and, and research is actually not widely available. Um, luckily, now also in cooperation with, with Livewire, we are making some of that analysis available, uh, which I'm, I'm, I can only assume investors will very much appreciate that. Yeah. We do it the, the whole year round. So we don't just do February and August, but we also do the in-between. Uh, because people might, like, might actually underestimate how many companies are reporting in between. I mean, we're like the likes of Aristocrat Leisure, Technology One, Internet Pivot, uh, some retailers and, and, and some other technology stocks. Yeah. Um, but if we stick to February and August, and I think this, this, it's very, this is quite, quite important, I think, because very, very underestimated, both by professionals and by retailers. There's a two-level uh, approach I would choose to, to assess a reporting season. And one is the, the macro level, so the higher level, which goes beyond the individual stocks. And, and the other one is obviously the individual stocks. And usually all the attention goes out to the individual stocks. But there is that higher level. And, and it is very, very important because at the end of the day, investing is not just looking at an Excel sheet, it's not just looking at the numbers. There is that ultimately really, really important ingredient, and that's sentiment. Because at the end of the day, it's investors doing the buying and the selling. And we are so driven by sentiment. I mean, and sentiment is really, really important because reporting seasons set sentiment. And not just for individual stocks, but for general themes. And I'll, I'll give you an example. We, we, we come out of the, the Trump election in late 2017. Everyone's talking about reflation trades. Now, we get the February reporting season in 2018. That February reporting season sees the likes of Altium, Appen, Ystack, and etc. put in such strong performances that they basically turn into the outperformers until the next reporting season irrespective of the whole wide world talking about the reflation trade. That's a, an ideal example of how a reporting season completely reverses the trend. And that was because it was showing investors that the fact that they all of a sudden started buying the banks and resources stocks and the cyclicals, and they were abandoning the CSLs, the Altiums and the Appens, that proved to them that that strategy was not the right one. And you got a complete reversal of that sentiment, and everyone can look this up. I mean, those, I remember that reporting season very, very well, because you would often see the share price trending lower, leading into the result, and then make a jump of 15, 17, 18, 20% on the day. Yeah? And, and that's one prime example of, of, of how our, our reporting season uh, coming out of it sets a complete new trend for the market. And that trend continued into August, and so, in August, and in so, August. So, the, so the macro is 
a, a broad set of company results, a cluster of stocks, yes. a, a segment of the market. Yes, it can. It can also be delivering yes. numbers yes. that set a trend and and focus the market's attention. If we come back from the, from the macro level, um, which which I have to emphasize, it it has so far the, the, the reporting seasons over the past few years have continuously benefited the performers in the market. And what I mean by that is is the the, the guys who, have, who were performing three or four years ago are still performing today. And, and, and I note that expectations remain high for this year. And the early indications are, for example, Westmet has performed and again beaten market expectations. Um, so there is there a trend there that if you were taking the Chinese approach, you would stay on board with that trend. I mean, these guys perform. That's also my, my favorite hunting ground. Um, if you can, if you, Basically, investing in particular in reporting season is all about getting the trend in earnings correct. Now, why is that important? Because we get warnings, profit warnings. We've had a few now. Nearmap, uh, uh, Treasury Wines, uh, we basically had like 15 or 17 uh, others, other companies issuing warnings. Flexicoop this morning, um, IWF. The way, the, the, the reflex from investors is always to, to, to become interested because those share prices often get clobbered. I mean, they go down by 15% in a blink of an eye. And then investors get interested. I mean, oh, surely that's an, that's an opportunity. Those who own the stocks often have a response of, ah, that's a bit of exaggeration. I mean, uh, it'll come good. But I think that's not the right way to look at those stocks. I mean, I think the right way to look at the individual stocks is that you look at what the trajectory is that the market is basically assuming for those stocks. Like, are they, are they growing between 15 and 20% for the next three years, for example? That's why the share price is where it is. If a profit warning comes along, Treasury Wines is a very good example of that one, all of a sudden the market resets those expectations to between 5 and 10%. The positive view is, oh, that's still growth. I mean, yeah, it's correct, but we come from 15 to 20. So that is essentially very bad news. So the share price gets clobbered and deservedly gets clobbered because so many people uh, lose money along the way down. Uh, that, that share price probably is going to be in the doghouse for quite a while. In particular, because a profit warning always um, reveals that not, not everything is under control. And in this case, it was. So. It probably will, will take time for management to get that right. And in the meantime, um, it's everyone's guess what the share price will do, but uh, low expectations are probably the right way to go. In a very general sense, if a company outperforms in reporting season, it can last up until the next reporting season, potentially, that the share price gets that boost. As long as the market expectations lift because of it, and, and then obviously the valuation lifts, and, and as long as that is not already well priced in. You've alluded to it a few times already, but this concept of post earnings announcement drift. Yes. Um, can you give people just a, your take on whether that is a, a real effect yes. in Australia and how they might be able to use that to add value to their investing? I can give some uh, very practical uh, examples but also we have to realize, all of us, that things change. Um, there are there lots of m market participants in the market that observe the market as I do, and everyone learns from the past. Yeah? I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a few, few uh, practical examples. For, for, for quite a number of reporting seasons, a company like REA Group, which is about to report, they would report and, and the share price would always fall after reporting. Yeah. Now, I'm a big fan of RBA Group, um, REA Group. I, I'm a long-term shareholder, and, um, and again, th that's where the difficulty comes in in, in assessing whether the, the disappointment in this boarding season, whether it actually changes the trajectory that the company is on. Yeah. So every time, often you see the, the share price running up before the release, the release comes out, oh, it's not as good as we thought. Sometimes the share price goes down by 15% or something ridiculous. Yeah? You blink twice, and by the next reporting season, it's up by 15 or 20 percent. Yeah, so it's the change between the fall after the report and the, and the next reporting season is massive. Yeah, and the trend, by the way, is keeps on going up. I mean, it's one of the share prices that that uh, that, that basically trends higher. 
on a pretty much a consistent basis throughout the volatility. Last year that didn't work. Yeah? So investors learned from the experience from the previous years that they thought like, we're not going to sell this stock, we're stupid. I mean, because it, I mean, it's actually a winner. Um, that's just one example how things change. Another one of, of, of the companies I own but that doesn't report uh, this season is Technology One. Right? And Technology One used to have this pattern every, every time that it would, it would just linger around for a while, then investors realized it's going to report next month. Yeah? So the share price would gradually leading in the report would just run up and it would sometimes it would be rallying quite, quite, quite strongly. Then the report comes out and it's, it's okay right? and then the share price just basically trends lower because they're all taking profits because it, it can't go higher. Yeah? No, that, that mechanism changed last year as well. So I think the, or the investors, the things I would, the advice I would give to investors is know your stocks. You know, like I know Technology One, I know CSL, I know REA Group. I know what's important for those companies. I know that if there's a, there's a little niggle here or a little niggle there and, and, and that causes a, a, a share market price to fall, that is not going to change the, the long-term trajectory of a stock. And um, so I'm, I'm happy to sit there, wait, see what happens. Well, and I, and I might, actually, might actually buy, buy some extra shares. Yeah? Yeah. You also have to observe those stocks because those lessons you can you can learn, yeah. Like the fact that, for example, if a stock tends to run up leading into the result and then selling off afterwards, those are things you can incorporate in your in so your. So you believe that there's strategy. a pattern. Of you, you can and tell emotion. the patterns. You can you can tell because, like one of the patterns that uh, yet has to change, is that um, short positions in JB Hi-Fi increase pretty much every year before the results release, and then the result comes out and they have to cover. Right? That has now been happening from memory, I think, four years, maybe, maybe longer. I mean, that's going to be interesting whether that's going to, that's going to survive this, this, uh, this month as well. Yeah? Are the shorters still uh, very confident that their, that their position is correct? Um, I think the odds are again in favor that they will beat expectations again. I mean, um, I mean, it's not for nothing that they, that analysts covering the stock call it the, probably the best retailer in the world. And indications are there that while um, segments of the retail sector are doing it tough in, in January, they've actually been doing quite okay. So I think the odds are again that the shorts will have to cover. And that's again one of those observations you, you can remember and you can, you can take into your, to your strategies. So you've got two, two points so far, know your stocks, yes, what's definitely, important for them. Definitely. Your second one is observe the, the patterns. Observe the patterns, yes. All right. They can change, but I mean, you can, sometimes they, they don't immediately change. Sometimes they last for quite a while, yes. What else is on your checklist for investors? Um, there is that fear that if a share price rallies on the day of release that you can't get on board anymore and in many many cases you can i mean i know everyone has so it's that okay to buy a strong result yes everyone has that fear i have it too you have to leave that thing like oh the share price is rallying away from you i mean it of course it depends you have to I mean you have to assess a little bit where where, where the share, where the share price is and where 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 the where the upside comes from but that is in particular the case uh, when it's a balance sheet issue or when it's when it's a, a stock that comes out of a very bad period because this is where I think the you you can as an investor you can leave the first percentage and upside to others because you are reducing your risk so I think the lower risk strategy still remains that you wait for the result to come out and you you see how that I mean, changes things and, and sentiment and, and if it's good, you get on board. If it's bad on the other end, um, while I don't sell on the first day, I do sell. And I do sell irrespective of what I paid for the share price. Uh, my advice to investors always is, it's never too late to sell. And uh, you only have to look at the share price graph of uh, Slate and Gordon, that um, you better sell when things go bad. And it doesn't matter if you paid uh, even 30, 40% more for the share price. Uh, it can go lower and companies like RCR Tomlinson, for example, or Forge, they actually go bankrupt. 
Yeah. Um, so it's never too late to sell, even though I know we get hooked on that. I paid so much more for the share price. And I don't want, don't want to look silly. Yeah. Or the usual one. Um, oh, I want to I want to I want to wait for a higher for a higher level and sell then. Right. Well, if the whole might might market is thinking the same way, you're not getting out. Huh? Yeah. So um, the strategy there is, I guess the first thing you're saying is, if you don't have to own a stock, don't, don't buy a stock for a result. Yeah. I, think, I, think it's, it's, um, I think it's extra dangerous because even, even a, an excellent performer like a CSL, for example, which, has, I mean, which is amongst the best performers in the market, even at times, because it's a sentiment thing, they can disappoint. It's not impossible, and because the share price has performed so well, I mean, it's up something like 60% plus from, from the 1st of January last year. It, it can easily shave off. Um, I'm just picking something, 7, 8, 9% or whatever. I mean, and if you're not on board yet, and you want to get on board, then, I mean, you can, you can, you can leave it. You don't, you're not just necessarily in a hurry, because if the share price goes up, it'll go up. Right. And in particular, in, in now, when we have a, a, a macro picture that at times will just push everything, everything down. Ideal scenario, I said it earlier, ideal scenario is you have a great performer coming out, can't really get the share price up because there's, there's other elements in play. And you go like, well, that's, that's the kind of stock you want to own. Rudy, um, I've got your checklist there. I was just, you mentioned a number of stocks throughout the discussion today. Yes. But if you could put together just a a short handful of stocks that you think look interesting, maybe yeah. where there's been that macro suppression yes. of expectations, yeah. where the underlying performance could yeah. surprise on the upside. What would be your, your top three or four picks? S stocks, stocks I um, own uh, myself, and which which definitely um, I'll, be, I'll be watching uh, this reporting season. Um, I always watch CSL. Right, that's just, which just goes without question. And I almost never sell CSL, um, not even if the share price goes temporarily lower. Companies that, that definitely look interesting to me is, for example, a Mcor. Uh, Mcor has been held back, uh, amongst other things. They've done a big acquisition in the U.S. Um, they. Um, there's a, there's a general um, question mark over the, the, the long-term uh, future of uh, disposable plastics and about uh, plastic packaging in general. Um, I, that could be, MCOR, this result could be one of the ones that sets off MCOR for uh, quite a big upswing. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we don't know in advance. We have to see what, what mechanism comes out. But that, see, when you have a stock like that, that, that has that skepsis hanging over it, if management comes out and goes like, listen guys, this is what we're doing, this is what's happening, and it's all looking great, like a, like a GUD, share price can, can go up until, until August and beyond. Uh, that's uh, another stock that has been a um, little, little bit in, in, that, in that question mark corner is Bepcor. Uh, I personally, I, I like Bepcor a lot. Um, I think the business is, um, is, is m much more resilient than, than, than the share market at times. Uh, gives management credit for, um, but we'll have to see again. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm expecting quite a quite a resilient result. Uh, hopefully, it, it turns sentiment into the positive, but it's very difficult to to gauge that in advance. But th those are definitely the stocks um, uh, on my radar. Watch the little niggling disappointments, yeah? and it's often it's not much, but it's a succession of. I remember before the really bad news hit Isentia, they had three or four reporting seasons. There was always something that wasn't quite right in, in the reports. And, 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 and that's, that's a, I know now that's a sign, that's a signal. I mean, that's uh, alarm bells ringing, pay attention. Okay, well Rudy, we've got some ideas on a few stocks to watch. You've given us a few of your, um, your tips for navigating reporting season. We'll be publishing your reporting season monitor on the website throughout yes. February. And you're about to get busy bashing out uh, uh, all I your be, notes. I, be, I, be, I better, I better get set. On huh? reporting season, it's gonna get busy. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming in. My pleasure.